there everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Mighty Glue Stick channel, I am your host AJ and I'm here to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Today I finally cover the lore of Bahamut, sire of all metallic dragons and creator of the dragonborn race. The platinum dragon, king of the good dragons, lord of the north wind, worm king, and now a god of all those who pray for justice and wisdom. The divine domains of Bahamut include air, cold, dragons, good, luck, law, nobility, protection, storms, hope, justice and strength. It's quite a few. Where these domains overlap with another greater god, typically Bahamut will be the uh, under the other greater god. For example, Torm is the greater god of char in charge of just uh, justice and paladins. So he empowers those who pray f to the powers of justice. And I will explain this a little bit later on. Oh, interesting side note. During the time of troubles, Torm was killed for a little while, and Bahamut, as far as I'm aware, was not one of the gods cast down into the mortal form during this time. It may be that Bahamut was elevated to greater god status during this period simply to take uh, and carry the portfolios of many good gods, and then handed them back over to whoever survived the trials Ao had set before them. Great power has never corrupted Bahamut, as he sees it as only as something that obligates him to help those who are without it. In the way that uh, he handles portfolios, the greater gods basically take care of all of the prayers that go towards that general principle. Bahamut's only interested in those who are pray, praying directly to him, so he doesn't listen necessarily to the to the prayers of those who just pray for justice. They, he listens to those who pray to Bahamut for justice. And the same way, he only really pays close attention to those who serve him, not those who, who just serve the greater good. Um, it's typically up to Torm to listen to those prayers. The Time of Troubles was a confusing chain of events at any rate, but Bahamut and the other Draconic Gods seem to have very little to do with it. It may be that Bahamut would have little to do with non-Draconic races at all if they didn't worship it, him and venerate him so much, and his decision to create the Ux Bahamuti may have something to do with why he has such involvement with the Pantheon of Farron. I'll certainly talk more about this in a minute. Currently, Bahamut dwells in the seven heavens of Mount Celestia, but he often wanders the material plane mostly in the form of a wise old man dressed very plainly accompanied by seven golden canaries. These canaries are actually seven ancient gold dragons polymorphed into the form of small birds. He seldom interferes with the affairs of mortals, his main concern is his nemesis Tiamat and her evil spawn, but of late he has taken an interest, a greater interest in the world of Toril because of the end of the Dragorage Mythal. Created during the time of dragons by high mages of the elven folk, the high magic effect tied the pharaoh wide mythal into the uh, king killer star. The Drakaraj mythal encompasses a quarter million square mile area where the king's killer star was visible over pharaoh and caused all dragon and dragon blooded creatures to slowly become more agitated and reckless, eventually becoming little more than raging beasts for ten days. The intention of the mythal was to free the mortal races from the tyranny of dragons. After so much was lost, so much chaos and destruction was caused by the genocidal war they waged against the Empire of the Giants, Astoria. It certainly achieved this goal and has prevented any recovery of the dragon, uh, dragon race as any sort of cohesive civilization ever since. However, this mythal is now gone, and the implications for dragonkind and all of the races of Toril are huge. It is Bahamut's intention that this does not lead to another age of dra dragon dominance over all lesser beings in Toril, nor does he wish the Tiamat any increased influence over the dragon species, so Bahamut and Tiamat have stepped up their activities and may well see um, a return to them battling by proxy upon the mortal worlds of mortals, time will tell. While Ao has proclaimed that the gods do not take any direct action down on the mortal world, no such restrictions seem to have been placed on Tiamat and Bahamut, actually any of the dragon pantheon. Let that sink in for a moment, so who knows me what may happen. As a draconic god, Bahamut is one of the many children of Io, the I, uh, original draconic Allfather. The early deeds of his children are the stuff of myth and legend with many conflicting accounts, but it is known that Tiamat and Bahamut have, and their other siblings all come directly from Io, or as many of dragons call him, uh, Asgarath. Asgarath never manifested himself before his worshippers, however he made his existence felt as a powerful presence in their minds. A lot of dragons know Asgarath as a female, both are correct, both are wrong. The oldest myths of dragonkind claim that Asgarath manifested physically only once during the act of creating the multiverse. Those who believed in this myth believe Asgarath was so huge that even his scales were larger than the largest mortal dragon that ever existed. 
Bahamut is a platinum dragon. Many scholars believe that there is only one platinum dragon, but actually there are three. All of them are divine, enormous dragons who radiate light and have a long, brilliantly scaled body in their natural form. Only Bahamut, though, has wings, however. Bahamut's sibling uh, platinum dragons are Tamara, the neutral good goddess of uh, light, life, and mercy, and forgiveness, and her consort Lendis, a lawful neutral dragon uh, god of justice and the judge of dragons in life instead of after the death. Some religions consider Bahamut to be their son, and even if true, the immense amount of time that has passed renders this relationship just a memory. Bahamut is certainly one of the most powerful dragons that has ever lived, and rarely appears on the mortal plane um, in anything close to true, his true size and majesty. So how powerful is Bahamut? Like, if Bahamut unleashed the full force of his breath weapon, how much damage would it do? Bahamut has three different breath weapons available to him, although he can use only one at a time. His ice breath is the most clear cut of his breath attacks. It's simply a fierce blast of incredibly cold air. His gaseous form breath is a swirling mist that stuns and turns anything or anyone it hits into a gaseous figure. The effect eventually wears off and the objects return to their original solidity. However, of course that's got to be extremely disorientating. However, he has one more, not seen on the mortal plane for a very long time, but it goes something like this. Suffice to say, his disintegration breath beam simply destroys everything in its path. Bahamut is immortal. He can hear, see, touch and smell at a distance of 10 miles. In addition, he can see invisible and ethereal creatures. If he chooses, he can perceive anything within 10 miles of his uh, worshippers, holy sites, objects or any location where one of his titles or name was spoken in the last hour. Bahamut can understand, speak and read all languages and speak directly to all beings within 10 miles and teleport at will. He can exist above or under the water with equal ease. Physically, Bahamut is one of the divine heavy hitters, capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with primordials and opposing gods. He has such enormous amounts of cosmic power flowing through him that merely striking him with a conductive weapon will cause it to explode in a spray of molten metal, unless it is heavily enchanted. There are very few entities that could pose a threat to him temporarily, but he um, is immortal. He's immortal, so Ao has simply deemed his existence mandatory. Bahamut is also a true pan-dimensional being. He exists simultaneously across many planes of existence. He is aware and present in all of them at the same time, to a greater or lesser extent. It's possible for Bahamut to manifest different versions of himself to create avatars. Those who serve Bahamut don't do just decide to do so. Well, some of them do, but most of them are called into service by Bahamut and know at their very core that they are divinely chosen to fight with the power and protection of goodness itself. Paladins and clerics of Bahamut, be they dragons, half-dragons or other beings attracted to and inducted into Bahamut's philosophy, strive to take constant but subtle action on behalf of their god, intervening whenever they are needed but striving to do as little as harm in the process as possible. Many gold, silver and brass dragons maintain simple shrines to Bahamut in their lairs, usually nothing more than, elaborate, uh, nothing more than a symbol of Bahamut scrawled into a wall. But, you know, dragons like to decorate, so it's quite often etched in precious uh, metals. In the very long history of conflict with Tiamat, Bahamut is said uh, to have had a direct hand in creating many new species, the most famous of, famous of which is the Ax Bahamuti, also known as the Dragonborn. For more information on the genesis and ecology of the Dragonborn, please see my video on them. Um, while Bahamut was less, has less need for exarch than any other de deity, he does have a few. One of the best known is Kayutha, a emissary of the Dragonborn clans everywhere. Kayutha is basically a very powerful dragon. Given his well-known penchant for walking the world disguised as a man, many priests of Bahamut emulate this appearance, even down to keeping seven trained canaries. Bahamut is also well known for his habit of personally testing the might of his most worthy champions, and he does this through pretty brutal full-on martial combat, with his gold uh, dragon worms on hand to heal the injuries he inflicts if he gets a little bit uh, carried away. These golden worms are mighty gold dragons. They are Borkad the Claw, Attorney at Law, 
Curler the eye, sneaking and sly. Songrad the wing, hear her sing. Grumar the voice, leaves you no choice. Marashok the tail, the happy denier. Through Anaxia, the, the presence, the first of light. And Urgala the Fang, General of Armies. They all have specific roles that they play in being uh, Bahamut's chosen companions and counsellors. And they sit in judgment with uh, Bahamut when he directly judges the, the deeds, the crimes of a mortal under his care. Bahamut's Shining Palace perches high in the peak of Mertian, the fifth layer, the platinum heaven of Mount Celestia. The Shining Palace is entirely constructed of precious metals, ivory and gems which simply can't be stolen unless Bahamut allows it. Those who follow Bahamut cleave to four uh, virtues, honour, justice, righteousness and nobility. All of the Platinum Dragon's servants embrace these qualities, letting them act as guides when confronting with moral quandaries. By acting as living examples of these virtues, divine champions can also inspire the same qualities in others and further the divine patron's presence in the world. Acting with honour means living without shame, striving in all things to be worthy of respect and admiration, and do nothing to sully your reputation or faith. Treat others with fairness, consider the needs of others before your own, and strive to emulate the Platinum Dragon in all that you do. Without justice, there can be no order, and without order, there can be no good. You should always work to protect the weak and the innocent, tolerate no crime, and seek swift justice for wrongdoers. As Bahamut's holy servants, righteousness means that all what that you do reflects your faith. You live an un, unimpeachable life, seeking the good and the wholesome. Reject temptations and corruption, corruption and uh, influence, and be the moral beacon in all that you do. With nobility, you act with dignity, avoid the base emotions for they cloud your judgment and lead to darkness. By temptation, even and resolution in your actions, will um, that's how you find focus. So to be noble is to be focused and above the, the, the base impulses. Bahamut stands at the forefront among the gods who champion good. Communities founded on principles of justice, equality, and virtue include the platinum, platinum dragon in their prayers, typically. For all these mortals look to Bahamut to resolve their troubles. Not all subscribe to the full tenets and spouse by his teachings, which are kind of like the knightly virtues. Um, but absolute good causes problems for any mortals. Good and evil are subjective concepts shaped by culture and social demands. Rather than struggling with an external ethical model, many fo simply follow their own personal moral compasses to guide them, and that's usually good enough, even among Bahamut's servants. Um, opinions vary as to the degree to which a society should shape its moral ideals, and many have waged bitter disputes over identifying the good or its absence in a community's laws. They debate these things, it's fairly typical everywhere. Without regular discourse with uh, the gods and when lacking any overarching religious structure, most faiths splinter and fracture since personal inter interpretations of a, about a particular commandment divide likewise like-minded in, um, individuals. Most dangerous sects are those that latch onto a particular commandment, placing special importance on its divine and as a divine decree so that they can, um, it eclipses any other command that the god might offer so it's not tempered by anything. Taking a particular piece of dogma out of context can pervert the gods' intentions and have disastrous results in the larger world. It results in persecution. What follows are ways Bahamut's faithful make, uh, may take extremist positions um, regarding this, these commandments. If you want to play a particularly zealous faith of uh, Bahamut as being a problem in your game setting, which it most certainly can be. Honour and justice can be perverted where a lord fails to enforce the laws equally in a community. Bahamut's priests supplant the constables and mete out justice. No matter how inconsequential, all crimes receive the same punishment. Death. Well, we'll leave it up to Bahamut so, to decide. Walk. Protect the weak. Bahamut sex, uh, moves into a poverty-stricken barony, seeing the lord's relative wealth and security compared to the peasants. The sect seeks the baron's castle and gives away his wealth. Not satisfied, the sect assumes control of the land, uh, violating privacy and restricting the freedoms to ensure a better quality of life, or equality at least for all, for, for some, if not all. So this is, uh, you see this echoed in the plot of the Game of Thrones where Cersei falls victim of her own um, manipulation of a zealous sect that um, decides to lay everyone low and expose everyone's crimes, no matter whether they're nobles or commoners. In fact, that's their way of usurping power. 
uh, divine just order, uh, defend the just order when the aristocracy result revolts against the queen. Uh, Bahamut's Templars come to the monarch as monarch's defense, sending her rule, uh, seeing her rule as just and divinely sanctioned. What the Templars do not realize is the queen is secretly plotting to plunge the nation into war by sending her armies to conquer a neighboring state. So in actual fact, they're supporting tyranny uh, because they're, they're cleaving too hard to authority. Liberate the oppressed. A nearby forest community under a druid king's rule rejects the social conventions upheld in a neighboring kingdom. The Bahamut priest sees the community as lawless and morally confused and deceived by its leaders. Uh, to liberate the people he sees as being oppressed, he leads an invasion force to unseat the druid king and install a leader more akin to his beliefs. Um, yeah, enough said on that one. Bahamut has had a few notable, uh, notable offspring, and many of them are very powerful and unique dragons in their own right. I'll be talking about them and other epic dragons very soon, but for now, be good. If you can't be good, be careful. Catch you later, everyone.